Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to our 103rd episode of the Sign Post webinar series. I hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. Uh, the series is brought to you by Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And this week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change launched its sixth assessment report. And it said that in 2010, between 2010 and 2019, average global uh, annual uh, greenhouse gas emissions were at their highest level in human history. But the rate of growth has slowed. And without immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade is, is beyond reach. Uh, and very appropriately today, we will be discussing how we can reduce the carbon footprint of cattle and pig manure. And we're delighted to be joined uh, by Stephen Nolan, uh, who is field research lead with Glassport Bio, and Sean Connolly, who's a PhD with NUI Galway and Chagask. And uh, you're both very, very welcome to the Signpost webinar. Thanks, Mark. To be here. So, yes, we can hear you loud and clear, perfectly. Good morning, uh, Pass. how are you today? Good morning, Grace, not a bother. All, all well down in Wexford. Well, I'm actually in Carlow, but yeah, they're grand in Wexford too. <laughs> you trust they're fine in Wexford. Um, so maybe Stephen, if you could um, give us a short overview of, of this project. It's uh, very timely and obviously uh, pig and uh, cattle story are both uh, very valuable, uh, particularly in the last uh, number of months to farmers as a fertilizer. But also uh, what we want to talk today about is how, how we can reduce that emission factor from, from these uh, slurries? So I've, I've done some time with Chagisk. I have a degree in agriculture and I've, I've more recently completed my PhD in environmental microbiology. And as part of that, um, we, I've done some work on uh, greenhouse gas abatement from, from agriculture um, with Glassport Bio, which is a spin-off um, company, a startup in, in, based out of NUI Galway. Um, we're doing some work with Chagisk, which we're going to introduce today. Sean is Sean is taking that on down in Johnstown Castle. Um, so it's just good to to present some exciting research and results that are we're we're producing in Ireland to to tackle greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and do more sustainable agriculture in general. So great, great. thanks, Stephen and uh, Sean. Where are you coming from today? Uh, currently in Galway. Yeah, uh, just back in UIG right now. Um, but for the last two years, I've been down in Wexford in Johnstown Castle and I've uh, been completing or close to completing my PhD uh, studying gas uh, gaseous emissions from cattle slurry. Uh, so a lot of the work I'll be presenting here today will be a lot of my uh, PhD work. So hopefully you'll find it a, a little bit interesting at least. Great. Oh, no, we're looking forward to it. And uh, best of luck with your PhD. I'm sure you, you can see the so much snow at this stage. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> great. Um, so, Stephen, I think you're going to lead off and um, we will um, hear a short presentation from you and then we we take questions from our audience afterwards. So please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to, to send us through your questions. And uh, today's session is being recorded uh, and will be available on the Chagas website as well as our YouTube channel. And if you want to listen to it in your car or your tractor or wherever you are, there will be a podcast version available of the uh, this webinar uh, on the platform of your, whatever platform you use for your podcast. So Stephen, we will ask you to share your screen and uh, we will talk to you after the presentation. So like we said, we're, um, pre presenting some research um, based out of Galway and Johnstown Castle in in um, Wexford. Um, so we're looking at climate change in agriculture, and I'm I'm working with Glassport Bio, which is a, a like I said a startup in Galway, and our lead product is what we've called Gas Abate, and it's. It's there in the title. It's the intention is to abate greenhouse gases from agriculture. Uh, within that, we have two projects that we're presenting today. Um, one is funded by the SEAI, and we've called it GebTech. It's um, it was our initial effort at uh, looking at cattle slurry and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, with the view to to improving uh, the potential for renewable energy production from slurry. 
And following on from that, then we applied a, a treatment to pig slurry and we've titled that the Piggergy Project. So we're going to present some results from that today as well. So as most of us are aware at this stage, the greenhouse gas emissions from from agriculture are significant across the world and even more so in Ireland, um, where 37% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture specifically. Um, within that 37%, approximately 25% come from manure management and enteric fermentation. And this is the where Glassport Bio is um, looking to tackle uh, first and foremost. The, the approach of, um, of some people will be the, to say that we have to just stop producing animals and, and beef and meat and dairy even, and that we should just all go to being vegetarians. Um, that would have significant impact on, on uh, the rural economy and, and on livelihoods in, in the countryside. Um, but we do recognize that we want to produce meat and beef and, and dairy as sustainably as possible. Um, and so to do that, the first step we see is tackling manure management. It's, it's probably probably the easiest step to address. And then that's where Bio are looking at um, feed additives to, to reduce enteric fermentation as well, because that's a bigger chunk of the pie, as you can see there. So the problem with um, gaseous emissions during manure storage is that while the manure is being stored, it's it's constantly emitting um, ammonia, methane, um, some, some toxic gases as well. Um, and during those emissions, uh, you lose nitrogen value, you need you lose carbon to the atmosphere. And once that's lost, it's 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 no longer valuable and it can't be be returned um, or recovered and applied to land. Um, so that results in increased mineral fertilizer purchases and uh, where where anaerobic digestion is being used to produce energy uh, results in a lower energy output from the slurry. Um, there are also some health and safety risks around stored slurry that, that the farming community is well aware of. Um, and of course, it, it contributes to the total greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Um, there are some, some steps that can be taken to mitigate emissions from stored slurry. Um, primarily, they're um, expensive, so they, they revolve around covering um, storage um, or applying um, uh, acid treatments, so sulfuric acid or, or different treatments. And some of them are, are ineffective. Some, some of them reduce either carbon emissions or ammonia emissions, but none of them prevent both carbon and ammonia emissions. So if, for example, if you cover a, a lagoon, you'll reduce ammonia emissions because there's less wind flow over the surface, but you will create a, an anaerobic environment that is conducive to producing more methane. So, um, yeah, so the current treatments are ineffective or expensive or both and can cost up to five euro per ton of slurry treated um, without producing any net benefit to the customer or to the to the farmer. So our solution, we've called it gas debate. We have a few different application types. So in, in smaller, smaller uh, applications, you could have a slow release block or in bigger storage tanks, we could have automatic dosing pumps or, or hand applied pumps. And the aim of the treatment is to target methanogens. Um, so methanogenic archaea are constantly producing methane in anaerobic environments. So we look to inhibit that microbial gas production. And in so doing, you reduce the bubbling of gas up to the slurry and, and re reduce other gaseous emissions as well as just the methane. What we've seen is a 95% reduction or up to 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions during storage. Um, so the benefits of our approach is that there aren't big startup or implementation costs. It's, it's relatively simple and straightforward. Um, and by retaining the nitrogen in the slurry, you, we've seen that we can lead to reduced fertilizer purchases, 
And by retaining the carbon in the slurry, if the slurry is then being fed to anaerobic digestion, it can be up to 38% of an increased energy output. Um, there are some other benefits there around carbon credits and reducing the carbon footprint of the supply chain, which a lot of corporate um, or say retail uh, customers are looking for. Um, and at some point in time, there will be this tradable carbon credit schemes um, coming into play. Um, so how it works is it, it's applied to liquid manures or slurries in storage tanks or, or in lagoons. And it's a, a, a product of a reaction of two active ingredients. So they work together to produce an inhibitory agent that targets methanogenesis specifically and reduces um, methane production in storage. It creates an environment that um, causes them to shut down for a period of time. It doesn't, it's not a biocidal agent. It doesn't kill them, but it, it, it inhibits their, their activity and thus pr prevents production and release of methane and by extension, biogas and, and other gases to the atmosphere. Uh, the benefits are obviously greenhouse gas reduction in the ag sector, which is, is the primary benefit. Um, but there are some secondary benefits, um, particularly where anaerobic digestion is being applied. Um, I, I also work with an anaerobic digestion plant in, in Kildare. Um, and so we see that by using slurry that's been treated, you can get an improved biogas yield. Um, slurry is notoriously low value for for uh, anaerobic digestion. So you want to retain as much of the potential methane yield as possible. Um, and then, like I said, we, we can see an improved um, nutrient value. So sulfur and, and ammonia in particular. Um, and in applications where enclosed housing, um, especially for, for pigs, there's some animal welfare benefits where they're, they're in close contact with high levels of hydrogen sulfide being emitted from the slurry. And if you can reduce that, it's, it's positive um, for animals as well. Um, so it currently, as, as we know, what happens is the manure is emitted or, or um, captured in storage. And then during, during storage, greenhouse gases are produced. Um, and as the greenhouse gases are produced, you lose the nitrogen and carbon value uh, of the manure. Uh, that manure is then spread on, on fields as fertilizer, but it's a low value fertilizer by the time it by the time it's spread, if it's kept in storage for any length of time. And the same if it's fed to digesters um, for biogas production, the carbon content is gone from it. Um, we aim to treat the manure and storage then and reduce greenhouse gas production so that it's a better fertilizer and a better feed for AD. Um, so um, I'll introduce you now to Sean, my colleague, who is uh, going to present his work on GebTech um, based in Johnson Castle. So. Great. Thanks very much, Stephen. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. So I'll be talking you through uh, GebTech, uh, my project from a PhD. Um, it stands for Green Energy Boosting Technology. Uh, it's a novel treatment for farm slurries to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and then for their downline implications of generating uh, more energy for anaerobic digestion uh, through that inhibition of methane. So worldwide, there's just under a billion cattle and it's the largest livestock group um, on earth emitting greenhouse gases from both enteric fermentation and manure management as Stephen was going through earlier before. Um, in 2018, we were awarded, awarded an SEAI grant. Um, and today we, I'll just kind of be uh, talking you through the lab scale trial, trials up to the medium scale trials. And then finally up to the, the larger scale trials that included a, a, a commercial farm. And what we want to achieve from these experiments is essentially a carbon enhanced manure feedstock that we can then bring to an AD reactor, increase the biogas yields, and then from that use the digestate as a fertilizer. Um, so next year we, I'll just move on to the lab scale trials here. So essentially here we have uh, 
our untreated slurry in green. And what we're trying to do here is, um, if you can just click next there, Stephen, we can see that we have small scale trials ranging from 10 grams to two kilograms. So they, we have varying concentrations used here. And we can obviously see that the gas of H dose three here um, is inhibiting the, the most amount of cumulative methane. We have compiled a data set based on the concentration, the frequency, and the, the different sources that the reagent can be uh, applied in. And this was kind of the optimization part of the project. Next, we moved up to these kind of two kilogram um, uh, mesocosms here. So we have a 1.6 kg experiment measuring ammonia emissions in this, uh, in this current picture down here uh, with the yellow lids. And this is also a, a very big portion, a very big part of the project was ammonia emissions, methane emissions, and um, a lot of the different gaseous emissions uh, trialed. So we had cumulative methane uh, emissions, and that was optimized for the additive formulation. And we saw a marked reduction in methane production um, at all rates. And the effect we found was dose dependent. So the higher, the higher the concentration you used or the higher dose you used, the more methane inhibition you actually uh, or was actually seen from the slurry. So move on to the next slide there. And again, this is just another um, kind of small scale trial. And this is again, more uh, cocktail optimization. So again, if you can see here in the, the, the green line here, uh, that's an untreated slurry. And essentially we wanted to determine how best added to add in our additive, whether to add it in as a powder or liquid, a pellet, all we saw was that there was very little difference. And you can actually see the different formulations up here, uh, the liquid powder and pellet up on the top right-hand side here. And, and this was the, this is a picture of the, the actual trial uh, in, which the, <clears throat> in which the biogas was actually captured from the slurry post-treatment. Uh, and then the biogas was actually tested afterwards. And, and again, there's no appreciable difference as long as you treated the slurry with the additive, uh, you saw a marked reduction. Uh, in the, the, the biogas and methane values. We also had a uh, independent trial carried out in Germany. As you can see on the, the bottom left here in these, uh, these black containers. And it's, what they saw was we, uh, th they saw a 95% reduction in uh, gaseous emissions from the storage when it was treated with our treatment. These were held in 25 degree storage tanks and biogas production was measured from both the treated and untreated slurry. And again, we saw this huge reduction uh, in the biogas um, uh, production from the slurry. And then as a result from that, uh, that, enhan that enhanced carbon feedstock was also trialed in an anaerobic digester also uh, in Germany. And those results would be presented uh, near the very end of uh, my slides. So next we'll move on to the medium scale trials, these, again, these, uh, these uh, 15 kilogram drums, and these were held for 10 weeks, uh, a 10 week period. And what we saw was that in these four different treatment phases, um, no or very little uh, gauge submissions were actually measured uh, during that time. Apart from treatment phase one after about 10 days, you can see. Um, so these were held at uh, 15 degrees Celsius, the manure solids content was 4%, and we were measuring greenhouse gases and ammonia emissions from this, but we we're also interested in the, the slurry characteristics like pH, the redox potential, dissolved oxygen, and all these factors help us determine how the treatment is actually affecting the slurry. Um, so we saw a 92% decrease in the overall, in the total biogas emitted from the slurry during storage, and that resulted in an 88.6% reduction in the total methane emitted from the slurry also. And next we we'll move on to uh, my own experiment in Johnstown Castle here. Um, so we had nine uh, one meter cubed tanks and we filled that, uh, we, we, we filled them with slurry essentially. And then we wanted to treat those, uh, we wanted to treat those tanks with this, the exact same treatment. So we were again going for the, 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 the same kind of testing regime. So greenhouse gases, uh, ammonia. We also wanted to test hydrogen sulfide, uh, pH redox potential. Um, so over here, you can see the tanker on the on the, the left actually filling these tanks. The tanks being uh, the, the tanks when they were full, 
and then some of our measuring equipment down at the bottom here. So our redox, uh, redox potential probe, uh, the lid that was testing some of the greenhouse gas emissions, and then um, over here, those, uh, those glass tubes measuring ammonia. And what we saw was that the hydrogen sulfide emissions post agitation, obviously where the majority of the H2S emissions is actually uh, seen, we reduced that by about 80% post agitation. And that was uh, purely from, from our treatment. Our ammonia was reduced by 50%. Our nitrous oxide emissions were reduced by uh, 85%, which is uh, very unheard of with slurry. We don't really think of nitrous oxide emissions uh, when we think of slurry. And also our methane was, was reduced by, uh, by approximately 40%, as you can see in this graph uh, just down here. So the red and blue are our treated slurries and then our control slurries. Uh, our control slurry is up here on 800 uh, grams per meter squared. And then these are just some of the graphs from the exact same trial. So our N2O emissions uh, from that same trial. You can see in this gray line here, uh, our control slurry uh, producing uh, lots of N2O. Uh, but no matter what you actually did, uh, or when we actually added in our treatment, the, the gas abate or the gas abate plus calcium chloride, which is uh, a nitrification inhibitor, um, we saw huge reductions in the N2O, uh, N2O production uh, from uh, from the slurry storage. We also see, and again, this is the same with the H2S emissions. Here, okay, don't worry. Uh, from the H2S emissions, uh, further 80% reduction uh, post agitation uh, once you treated the slurry. Uh, so then we went, or we wanted to uh, test how this actually affected the AD process. So again, we went to Germany in that uh, same trial that I mentioned before, uh, independently verified um, anaerobic digestion trial in which treated and untreated cattle slurry was used. And what they saw, there was a there was a 38% increase in the biogas output um, from the treated slurry compared to the untreated slurry. Next, we also had triplicate 10 liter bioreactors in NUIG. This is a picture of them over on the right hand side here. And this is run in a continuous uh, anaerobic digestion format. Um, so these were co-fed cattle slurry and food production waste or grease trap waste. Uh, whereas the graph on the left was only a mono digestion. Um, but again, it was a fairly similar story with the 10 liter bioreactors, um, where we saw an average methane uh, increase of between 14 and 18% uh, when we used uh, treated slurry versus untreated slurry. Next, again, if we're not going to be uh, bringing it to AD, if we actually just spread it, uh, what happens? So. We wanted to test the fertilizer potential of the treated manure. Um, so on a small scale, we had small scale agronomic pot trials of perennial ryegrass treated with untreated and then gas abate treated manure. Um, and we saw a 15% increase in the dry matter content of the grass. Uh, and the grass is harvested at, at week three. And we also saw an enhanced sulfur concentration in the treated slurry. And then that also mapped over onto the grass very well. And you can see up here on the top right, these kind of greener samples. And this is also very important. If you, increase, if you decrease your H2S emissions, your sulfur content goes up in your slurry. And then that paper down on the bottom uh, of that slide, um, Claire Aspel's paper uh, from also Johnstown Castle, uh, kind, of got, kind of goes over the nitrogen use efficiencies of increased sulfur content. Um, and decreased um, nitrogen leaching from soils. Very, very interesting paper if anyone is in interested. Next, we wanted to go on to a commercial dairy farm, a, a kind of full scale, uh, a full scale trial where um, we wanted to test the additive in its kind of its, its largest form. So this, uh, this farm had 220 cows and three tanks. Uh, ranging from 485 to 590 meters cubed of slurry in total. So as you can see over here with this uh, this uh, gray arrow on the very top of the uh, on the of the graph, this is our baseline data. As you can see, you you, you get some peaks uh, with with the, with the methane data. But as soon as we add in the get take uh, the the gas abate application here in red, you can see a marked reduction in the amount of methane actually um, actually emitted. So again, we, we get a 78.6% reduction in the, uh, in, the, in the methane output once we actually added in um, the gas abate uh, product. Move on there, Stephen. Thanks very much. 
finally, we are the, ga- the, the, the Glassport team did a climate impact forecast on a, a theoretical farm, uh, a 2000 car, in te- a, a 2000 cow intensive farm in Germany. Um, so this German farm, this theoretical farm, had anaerobic digestion on site for electricity in which 100% of that was used. And then heat energy of which 50% was used. Um, and the farm has a use for the digestate as a fertilizer also. So the climate impact um, or the climate impact forecast from, from the EU, this tool that we use from the EU, uh, includes the gas vape production, the production of the gas vape products, the transport of the components, the fertilizer transport, the emission of the slurry management, uh, the emissions from the gas vape pumps, uh, the biogas output or the increased biogas output from AD and the ammonium content of the digestate following the gas vape tree manure. And what we can see is that there was, um, sorry, no, just, just hit um, next there again, Stephen. There you go. You can see a, a 3.7 kiloton uh, saving in, in CO2 equivalencies. And this is equivalent to a 3,700 uh, 3, uh, potentially tradable carbon credits uh, for a farm if, if, um, uh, if they do end up being uh, tradable. So again, it's a, it's a very huge saving in terms of carbon. Um, and something that can be looked to for the future uh, to actually save on carbon and potentially a, a new income source for farmers. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'll hand you back over to Stephen, who will be talking about uh, Pigergy. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so having having successfully looked at um, cattle slurry and treatment of cattle slurry for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we wanted to apply the treatment to pig slurry um, to see if we would have a similar effect. And so we titled this project um, Piggergy. Um, there's 677 million pigs worldwide, about 1.6 million of those are in Ireland. So, so we've carried out some research on, on Irish pig farms to see what we could see. Um, we started off though with laboratory scale trials again, just um, testing pig slurry in the lab and under different treatment doses and, and cocktails. And we scale that up through medium scale and now onto larger scale on-site trials. Um, again, we, we considered the potential for the manure feedstock to be enhanced for biogas production and anaerobic digestion, uh, BMP being biomethane potential there. Um, so the lab scale trials, consisted of 10 started at 10 grams and scaled up to one kg of of slurry using varying concentrations of product and assessing the methanogenic activity um we saw we saw from the start that there was some some treatment effect um again varying with dose variants and um inhibiting methane production at the early stages of storage um, so we scale this up to um, 16 kilos in, in 25 liter drums and ran a trial for 250 days, um, which took in the, the start of COVID. Um, so these these trials were carried out in in uh, my my own shed under controlled um, environment, uh, so that I could keep monitoring them while the labs were closed. Um, we saw. So, some significant results from that, more dramatic uh, than with the cattle story for sure. Um, so, biogas production was essentially shut off for for a long period of time, about two hundred days, and it recovered towards the end. Um, within that, CH four um, was also uh, dramatically uh, reduced, and so. CO2 was, was similar, well, H2S was dramatically reduced at the start and, and H2S production then recovered after about 100 days and similar effect for ammonia. So we tested, yeah, we tested a lot of different um, things that we had done with cattle slurry and, and so like a 90% reduction in biogas, um, a more significant reduction even in, in methane. So of the gas that was produced, uh, less of it was um, methane, um, more of a CO2. We saw a reduced 43% reduction in total in ammonia. Again, 
most of it in that initial 100 days and the same with hydrogen sulfide. Uh, we then wanted to scale that up. So we went to uh, IBCs, one meter cubed IBCs. We put about 750, 770 kgs of pig slurry in there. Um, we used uh, heat jackets, as you can see in the picture on the right there. And we, we tested it again. And again, we saw uh, dramatic reductions in, in biogas production over the course of the trial. 77% um, reduction approximately in biogas and again even more significant reduction in methane uh, so what was interesting in this trial though is that after after a week of, we tested um, odor producing compounds and saw a dramatic reduction in odor producing compounds and anyone who's involved in the pig industry would be aware that in order to increase capacity or, or to even review licenses um, or any of that uh, odor is a massive concern for for pig farms and so the ability to reduce odor production from from stored slurry is is significant um, beyond just greenhouse gas emission reduction um, we then tested that slurry in in um, lab scale trials just to to get a feel for the impact that treatment had on um, biogas production and anaerobic digestion downstream. And we saw a 46% increase in biogas yield from treated slurry compared with untreated. And of that biogas, there was a higher concentration of methane, which is important for um, biomethane producers, of which green generation will be, will be the only one in in the south of Ireland um, at the moment, the only one injecting biomethane into the grid. But um, so a 60% increase in biomethane production is, is again, very significant. So we applied the same climate impact forecast uh, tool as Sean demonstrated earlier with, with cattle slurry. And we took a, a, a large a pig farm in an Irish context um, with an AD plant generating biomethane and assumed a use for the digestate, um, uh, which digestate is used as a fertilizer for, for tillage crops around Kildare and Ua for sure. Um, and so when we applied the same tool, the carbon footprint reduction wasn't as dramatic as it was for the cattle slurry farm, um, but it was still significant and we saw per ton of slurry treated um you get a 52 kg of co2 equivalent saving which amounted to 839 tons of co2 equivalent um saved uh, or or uh, mitigated um in the context of a, of a large irish pig farm um there's some equivalence there to make it understandable for for uh, everybody. So um, I'm not sure how elephants get in there are irrelevant in an Irish context, but anyway, they're, they're there anyway. So um, the next phase of that is to look at the potential for trading um, that saved carbon um, in terms of carbon credits. And that's something we're working on um, in the background, which would make it much more attractive um, to everybody involved. So Glassport Bio have uh, a couple of other projects in the works. Um, SEAI have funded um, the scale up of the pig treatment to, to large scale. Um, we have an industry academic partnership um, and with an aim to market launch in 2024. Uh, we have trials planned for, for Ashley's pig farm in, in Waterford and uh, they have an associated AD plant so we can verify our findings at full scale. Um, we have also received funding from the EIC um, for scaling up the cattle treatment to market. Um, and the aim is to launch that in 2024, um, initially in Ireland and then looking further afield than that. So um, that's our work and thank you for listening. Uh, we'd welcome any questions you'd have. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Sean. Uh, really enjoy that presentation. Really, really innovative uh, work that you're doing.
there with uh, Glassport Bio, Chagisk and, and NUI Galway. Um, and uh, lots of interesting questions coming in there. Just remind people, if you do have a question for uh, Sean or Stephen, please do use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, just, uh, I suppose, uh, from my own perspective, just looking at the, the work that you've done and the, the testing that has been done, how far away is this from being commercially available or is it available now to, to, uh, to farmers? Um, so the, the intention is to validate our findings at full scale in the next year. Um, we're, we're working on that and then we'll be looking to launch in 2023, 2024. Uh, so in the next year or two, we'll be looking to launch the market fully. Brilliant. Brilliant. I'm sure I see there's a, quite a lot of interest from our colleagues in the Department of Agriculture joining us today. Um, I'm sure this is a you know, a, a potential game changer when it comes to reducing emissions. Just, just in terms of those figures that you presented there on the CO two equivalent reductions, you, you I think it was approximately one hundred kg per ton with cattle slurry, and uh, was it fifty two with the, the pig slurry? How, what does that equate to in overall percentages? You know, uh, what, what as a percentage difference with and without the the uh, the additive? So. It came to about eighty five percent reduction in in biogas, um, eighty five to ninety five percent reduction in biogas production. So obviously, methane is a significant component of the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So if you could reduce greenhouse gas emissions from slurry by 80, 80 85 percent, even that would be if it's about three and a half percent of the total, you're you're looking at. A three percent reduction in in the Irish context um, overall. So um, that in itself is a massive step towards our total greenhouse gas emissions and and reaching targets. Um, the next phase of that obviously is then to look at the feed additive side of things and reduce enteric fermentation emissions. Um, and that's something we're working on in in the background as well. With again with Chagask and NUIG. So. And in terms of how somebody would implement this on their farm, I know you showed us a slide there with a, a device there that does it. Is it a slow release? Maybe could you just talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, so, how, so that, how that would actually operate. For sure. And, so we look at, does it require specialist installation as well? Do you think uh, maybe it's a bit early to say that, but yeah. just, just from your, your own uh, view on that? So we've looked at a couple of different options. Uh, one of them is is essentially a briquette type thing that you'd throw into the slurry tank and, and it would slow release over time. Um, another option, we have an engineering lead on the, who's looking, especially in pig slurry context, um, of injecting. So it's a fairly simple setup with, with some pumps um, that would inject uh, the treatment. And so when you see the, the biogas production starting to recover it would it would be smart and essentially inject and dose treatment as it needs to every 10 days to two weeks um once that it would be fairly cheap to install it it's not a complex system and once it's installed it would just sit there and, and work away in the background the farmer or the user wouldn't necessarily have to have too much input into that um so we want to simplify it and make it as easy as possible for for people to use um so that it's applicable um, yeah, Sean, you talked about the uh, increased sulfur concentrations in, in mm -hmm. the slurry. Uh, how does that work? I mean, is there not the fixed amount of sulfur there it, 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 or is there an availability issue there that uh, the process is, is uh, affecting? Yeah, so when you start off with slurry, there is a, a, a finite amount of sulfur within that. However, when that gets mineralized to let's say sulfate that would be reduced to um, h2s um so h2s sulfur so if you can reduce your h2s emissions by 80 percent or um we're, we're looking at actually increasing that also if you can reduce it by 80 percent you're not actually going to be losing a lot of that sulfur from the slurry so from what we found there was a, a four or five percent um decrease in um uh in the sulfur content with slurry over maybe a 40 day period. So by, by actually using this treatment, you can actually keep that sulfur within the, uh, uh, within the slurry. Good. And, and just on that, that uh, hydrogen sulfide piece, I mean, there is a farm safety risk there with 
uh, hydrogen sulfide release during agitation. Is, is that something that you would see having uh, reduced risks there with for far, from a farm safety point of view? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, when 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 you look at when when you look at uh, farm safety as a whole, like H H two S emissions are, um, it's one of the first things you learn about as as a farmer that to stay away from slurry tanks when they're being agitated. So if you can reduce that that risk, that that would be a huge thing um, for Irish farmers and uh, and farmers in general. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sean. And just to Stephen, has uh, has there been any estimates of the costs of, of such a system or such a an additive for farmers, or have we any idea of what what where that's going to be pitched at? Yeah. So. We have some some early indications, but until you commercialize it and, and produce it at scale, you're you're looking at s- small volumes and having to. So the the price we're paying for for the treatment just now wouldn't be the price in, in when it comes to market. So I, I think it's too early to say exactly, but it, it would have to make sense for the farmer, and it would have to yeah make sense for all involved. So it wouldn't be um, prohibitive for sure. So. Okay. Thanks very much. So, so we, we'll just, just go to some audience questions here. I don't know if Pat is, is around there, but he's uh, uh, possibly taking a, an important call. There you are, Pat. Oh, no, back I'm with here. Us. I'm here listening. Yeah, to yeah. Just there is a question there uh, around the, the temperature dependency there on the, the, the additive to work. Um, if, if either of you would like to, to take that yeah. one. So we've, we've challenged, we wanted to challenge the treatment. So obviously at lower temperatures, you get lower emissions. And so it would be easier essentially for the treatment to be more effective because it's there's not as much of an activity that it has to address. So for example, in the Kaiserslautern trials, you saw it was at 25 degrees. So at 25 degrees, you're getting a lot of emissions. The methane, the methane conversion factor is fairly high at that stage. Um, in an Irish context, the temperatures will be lower. And so whatever effect we're seeing at 25 degrees will be exaggerated and, and magnified at lower temperatures. For a slurry, for stored slurry in the, in the pig farm context, um, for for sows, um, the temperatures maybe are at 20 degrees in the, in the sow house. So the, the slurry is actually quite warm underneath the sows. Um, so maybe 17 degrees. And so you do have about a 32% um, emissions factor there for, for slurry under under pigs and so we want to be sure that we can we can tackle that higher temperature the temperatures under wieners then will be even higher so so we we've we've used those heat jackets on the on the ibc's to make sure that we're seeing the same effect at higher temperatures as as the lower temperatures so yeah that that fact alone that uh, emissions are higher when temperatures are higher is is interesting uh, I, I wasn't aware of that that's a uh, that that probably has implications for above ground versus below ground storage, sure, and yeah. yeah, like like you described there, the, the different types of uh, slurry or uh, housing systems that are there. Past uh, some some a lot of very uh, very relevant questions coming through here. Yeah, and I suppose one of the the, the first ones is just uh, what is the the active. Uh, ingredient, or what is the imp- or what is the the, the methodology of a secret sauce? Is that the, the phrase you're asking for, Pat? <laughs> um, it's it's just two compounds that, that are commonly available, but they, when they work together, they they react with each other and and cause an effect. Obviously, it's it's early days, so we we want to keep that to ourselves just now. But okay. they're they're safe compounds. They're um, they dissipate. Uh, rapidly in the environment so there's no environmental concerns they've been approved by the the Irish authorities as non-biocidal so um they're they're safe and and clean um yeah because because yeah. The, the issue of safety versus some of the other products that are being talked about some of the the the, the acids in particular yeah. I think are making farmers very nervous of, of what's sure, going yeah. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. Th- I think that's a, a real positive. One of the other one interesting question we we have uh, flag now in the in the medium term uh, a potential requirement to cover stores. Uh, do you see this as a potential alternative uh, uh, treatment that that might uh, uh, prov- or, uh, replace the need for for that to happen? Sure. Well, covered stores. Um, so it's a requirement in some places already. So and there is a benefit to 
to covering tanks. The issue with covering is that it's it's ex extremely expensive relative to the, the size of the tanks. So there's a huge capital expenditure there. And it doesn't do anything to stop methane production in stored slurry. In fact, it encourages methane production because it creates an anaerobic environment. It does. It is effective for ammonia um, reduction. So there is nothing to say that this treatment used in conjunction with cover stores wouldn't wouldn't be a good option. But in the short term, uh, um, for sure, it, this is much cheaper and and it's effective at both methane and ammonia reduction. Um, but I think we, we are heading towards a, a case where for sure all kind of new um, facilities will, will be required to have covered storage um, okay. and, and possibly even refrigerated storage, which again is expensive to install and, and uh, has, a, has a significant cost of operation as well, as you could imagine. Yeah, there's a question in there about uh, uh, the the, uh, the the potential for AD when you're suppressing the methane. Uh, what's the reversal process to, to try and make sure that, that you can then get the methane yeah. out of it? Is there it's any a good question? There? Yeah, it's a good question, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about this. So essentially, the the treatment wears off after a certain amount of time. So it depends on your storage period before before going to AD. So if you know that uh, the slurry will be stored for 10 days and then eventually it'll be fed into anaerobic digestion, then you would treat accordingly. Um, if you know it's a shorter period of time, you would you would also treat less and then there will be repeated treatments if you're going to store it for longer. Um, so yeah, so the, we've seen then that once it is stored, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, negatively affect the methanogenic population in the anaerobic digesters either. So we haven't seen an inhibitory effect in anaerobic digestion itself. What we've seen is that the first couple of stages of anaerobic digestion, so the hydrolysis and the, the uh, acidogenesis proceed as normal. So the slurry starts to degrade and break down, but we inhibit the final stage of, of anaerobic digestion and so actually it's a much better feedstock it's almost more ready to go than than slurry that's just been degrading over over time in, in a storage tank um so yeah it's it's actually positively affects anaerobic digestion as far as we can see there's a, a question there Stephen, in relation to agitation and uh, you, you i think you mentioned that there was a, a reduced agitation time required for uh, slurry that has this treatment um according to this question or anyway um but is there you know without the methane gas bubbling up through the slurry is, is there um a risk there that there would be a a, a greater crust being formed on, on the top of the tank um so it just i don't know have you looked at that yeah so we have to see the dynamics in, in full scale tanks um, for a start but crust even if there was a bigger crust being formed crust formation is one of the key ways of actually eliminating some odor and, and ammonia emissions from stored slurry. So uh, even if there is a better crust being formed, then, then it's actually a net positive. Um, so okay, very good. There's a question there about dry matter uh, uh, of the, the slurry. And I think the, the example you took was looked to be a very high dry matter slurry, but yeah. uh, I suppose a lot of slurries at farm level, particularly I suppose on dairy farms tend to have a lot of water coming in and, and on pig uh, farms, depending on the feeding system, uh, can vary significantly. Uh, yep. So uh, what's the impact of that? And, and is there issues around the, the, the economic viability of, of the use of the product where you might have low dry matter slurries? Yeah, so again, the idea with using high dry matter was just to challenge the treatment. Um, obviously, if there's more uh, volatile solids available to the the methanogens, then you're more likely to get a bigger volume of gas coming off. Um, we have tested um, a variety of different dry matters um, range, and we're settling on about eight percent solids for for dairy slurry, just as a as kind of um, nice, me happy medium of where we're at. So we're testing a range of uh, temperatures and a range of dry matters. Um, so pig slurry, I I, I work with a pig farm here in, in um, 
in Kildare and the pig slurry will range from 2% where there's a lot of washing going on to up to 4 4.5% for, for wieners. So we're, we're very aware of the different ranges and, and we're looking at treating all, all ranges. We did want to really push the product and test it at temperature and with higher dry matter as well, just to make sure that it works um, effectively. Do you have any, um, I mean, are there any other concerns about the project, product, like let's say bar the price? Um, I mean, are there any any pitfalls to, to using this type of technology? Um, that's a good question. I... Is it just I'm good stuff? I'm struggling to see. I'm struggling to see it. Yeah, um, I suppose I, I'm coming from the. I'm, I'm looking at it there. I mean, the, the figures you presented at the start there, the, the 3.5 percent uh, yeah. of of the emissions or the methane emissions are coming from um, from from manure storage. So this is tackling a relatively small portion of that. But there is a an ammonia component here as well, isn't there? Yeah. So so. Yeah, the three and a half percent is small relative to some of the other some of the other emission sources. But if you were to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, let's say by three percent, that would, that's dramatic in terms of achieving these one and a half degree savings or 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 whatever else. And so yeah, the, the danger I guess is that we just settle there and say okay, we've we've done the slurry bit and just leave it at that. Yeah. You saw there the enteric emissions are over twenty percent as well, so we do want to look at feed additives and and uh, tackling enteric emissions because, um, especially in an Irish context where animals are out on land more, uh, um, this mightn't be as good or as relevant. So you do need to also look at enteric uh, emissions. In other countries where animals are kept indoors all day long and they have higher temperatures and all that, this may be even more applicable. But um, the danger is we just kind of settle and say, okay, we've we've tackled slurry and and we can see an effect and um, and then we don't step on from there. But we need to push on and and really really make agriculture sustainable so that we can just have a continuing. Um, Oh, that's a really important point. I mean, uh, that that three point five percent is particularly low in Ireland because of the uh, the outdoor uh, pasture based systems that we have in this country. So uh, no doubt it will have have a higher impact in, in those other countries. Um, Pat, back to you. Yeah, no, there's there's a, a question in relation to the the verification uh, of the potential emissions and and uh, trying to get it potentially accepted as part of our our inventories. Uh, yeah. Are you working towards that? We are. Yeah, we're working with. Um, there's a couple of different verification bodies, um, and we're engaging with two or three of them. So that's part of the process before launching this on the market is to have a verification in place so we're, we're talking to two or three different bodies that are do verification of um greenhouse gas emission savings um, yeah and and i suppose another issue that's kind of in the in the the new or not so much in the news but engaging people a good bit at the moment is the nitrogen value of the stories coming out yeah. Uh, Sean, uh, have you tested the, the, the nitrogen and, and other constituent parts, or I suppose it's, it's going to be particularly nitrogen, to, to see is there a difference and, and the availability then of that nitrogen, is it showing any, any difference? Yeah, so we, we did a suite of tests on all of the slurries that we were, that we were testing. Um, at the very start of the project, the ammonia emissions uh, were higher. And that was simply down to the way in which we were actually adding the treatment to the slurry. However, ammonia is more of an engineering problem rather than a microbial problem. So once we have once we had that kind of engineering problem fixed, we um, we had that ammonia problem under control. What I will say from my own um, experiments is that we had a, a, a neutral impact on the available um, tan total monoclonal nitrogen. So from that point of view. Um, there's very little impact on the actual nitrogen in terms of losing it as ammonia. So, so in 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 general, you're you're saying the slurry will have a very similar value to the existing mm -hmm. slurry. It, it, it's not in, it, because it's holding on to or, or losing less. You're not getting a significant no boost. Oh, no. Yeah. 
from from we my own. From my... A, yeah, so we did carry out pot trials on, on slurry that we treated in in NUIG as well, and we did see an increased dry matter um, from the grass uh, after a single application of slurry that had been treated. So there, that's still still open. That's one of the questions we have still. Um, we intend to do more field trials and and. Uh, Test, test it and, and get solid results on that as well. So. And what's just a, a question there? What's your kind of timeline that is potential for for uh, coming to market if things go well ac across the project? So we'd be hoping to uh, within the next two years have both the the cattle slurry and the pig slurry treatments available on the market. So that's the intention. So we have some funding secured to bring the, bring it to market essentially now and we're going through all the appropriate steps to do that. And I suppose importantly, you see this as being something which uh, is not going to take a huge amount of effort at, at farmer level, that, that you're working on systems for application that will effectively work pretty much on their own without, without huge uh, managerial yeah. content or managerial effort involved. For sure, as we know, farmers are are busy uh, as it is, and so um, something that's going to be labour intensive uh, isn't isn't going to fly. So we want to make it as user friendly as possible, and and that's what we're working on now, just kind of automating automating application, um, and, and that's going to be a key component of the treatment as well. I just want to make a, just an important clarification there that the figure 3.5 percent that I quoted, I thought it was 3.5 percent of agricultural emissions. No, it's in the fact total. it's 3.5 percent of total emissions. Yeah. So that's a really important distinction to make here is that that, that the, the this figure or this this technology, uh, yeah, has 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 really a, a huge potential mm -hmm. to 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 reduce a total total emissions from the, from agriculture. One final question, one possibly important one, the, the uh, viability of uh, AD in Ireland has, has always been problematic. And I think I, with a, a development like this and with, with what's happened, I suppose, with prices over, over the last while, do you see this as having, uh, 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 or the, having the potential to give a major push to that industry uh, in Ireland? Sure. So something significant that's happened in the last year, um, I, I would do some work with Green Generation in, in Nerny and County Gildare, and we've received um, these international uh, sustainability carbon credits, which makes the gas that we produce far more valuable. It's, uh, it's almost out. It's, it's far more valuable now than it was. And so AD itself is now far more viable than it was even a year ago um, in an Irish context. And then this any slurry you use for AD it gets a double bonus essentially under the Renewable Energy Directive 2. So um, that again makes it far more viable. If you were just treating slurry and, and not using any co-digestion products with it, you probably wouldn't produce enough gas to make it viable. But when you factor in carbon credits, which are there and available and in play, they're not theoretical, they're, they're physically there in place. And then you, you talk about uh, a 30% increase in gas produced from that slurry as well, then, then this makes it far more viable for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. There we must leave it. Uh, we're just over time, I'm afraid. Uh, lots of huge interest in this topic. And um, maybe uh, Stephen and Sean, you could uh, join us next year when you're, uh, you know, in, in the market and uh, just to, to get that uh, feedback from, from farmers would be excellent, I think. Um, huge, a product with huge potential uh, from, from the figures that you presented today. So thank you both for uh, the time uh, that you've put into your presentation. And uh, Pat, thanks very much for helping with questions. And um, next week, we'll be joining you next Thursday uh, rather than Friday, given the uh, the week that's in it. And we'll be joined by Elaine Cross, who is Corporate Affairs Manager with Dan Owen. And she's going to be telling us about the the known sustainability story. Uh, so really looking forward to uh, that, that presentation next week. Uh, my thanks to Andy Boland, Yvonne Marr, uh, on the, our production team, and also to Michelle Lavelle and Nula Cully on our Connected team for uh, looking after the, the background tech, technical piece as well for us. 
So until next Thursday, uh, thanks again, Stephen and Sean, and uh, we hope you enjoy your weekend. And uh, what better way to start off the weekend with, by talk, than be talking about slurry. So uh, <laughs> we, we will uh, see you next Thursday and uh, uh, do, do, do take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.